Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you all to what is the 19th lecture overall in this series of lectures and the ninth this year. It is indeed a shame that we are not hearing today's contribution in person in the wonderful and historic Green Street courtroom that has given its name to this wonderful lecture series. However, it is a credit to the organisers that the series has continued throughout the pandemic. And indeed, I'd like to thank Paul, Frank and Elizabeth for their hard work. And indeed, the strong viewing figures are testament uh, to its popularity. Today is somewhat special as our lecture today is being given by the, our esteemed colleague from England and from the Bar of England and Wales, Mr. Dominic Reeve. Dominic is a QC since 2008. He's a master of the bench or a bencher of Middle Temple with whom we at King's Inns have very close ties. But it is as a politician that Dominic is probably better known to you all. He was a Conservative MP for Beaconsfield from 1997 to 2019, during which time he served as Attorney General for England and Wales from 2010 to 2014. And indeed, we probably know him better from his uh, appearance on television and in print during the turbulent Brexit process, where he was a prominent Remain supporter. However, that does not define the man. He is also an avid Francophile. He's president of the franco british Society, and he also holds the Legion d'honneur. But he also has strong Irish roots as well. And indeed, we are looking forward to the time when the pandemic has eased and we can greet Dominic in person. And indeed, on behalf of the Inns, as chair of the Inns, I would like to extend an invitation to him to dine with us in recognition and gratitude for his contribution today. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Dominic to address you on his topic. The topic is uh, the roots and realities, legal and otherwise, of English exceptionalism. And I do note that exceptionalism is indeed in quotes. So Dominic, thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh, for that very kind introduction. It's both a pleasure and a privilege to who have been invited today to give this talk, to spending time in Dublin, a city I always enjoy visiting, but also offered an opportunity to reflect after the tumult of Brexit on the subject, the nature of sovereignty, identity and the rule of law, which has undoubtedly become prominent in our public and political affairs in the United Kingdom, with consequences for our neighbours. Even though this talk must now be virtual, I can think of no better group to do this with than yourselves, living as you do in a country whose history, entwined as it is with that of my own, has had some similar experience of this, born in part of the complex and difficult relationship which our shared history has at times created. I chose as my title, the long one, The Captains and the Kings of the Sceptred Isle, a brief examination of English exceptionalism and its current effects. The Captains and the Kings comes, of course, originally from Kipling's poem Recessional, which I first encountered as a prep school boy in England. Written in 1897 in the form of a hymn at the time of Queen Victoria's Jubilee and the height of Britain's imperial power, it expresses pride in the British Empire's achievements but equally a concern that it would go the way of all previous empires. The key message is that boasting of achievement is in vain in the light of the permanence of God and the impermanence of man. But it's also intensely patriotic. And it only give you the first two verses and the last to convey its mood. God of our fathers known of old, Lord of our far-flung battle line, beneath whose awful hand we hold dominion over palm and pine. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. The tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart. Still stands thine ancient sacrifice and humble and a contrite heart. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. And last verse. The heathen heart that puts her trust in reeking tube and iron shard, all valiant dust that builds on dust and guarding calls not thee to guard, a frantic boast and foolish word, thy mercy on thy people, Lord. That was only much later on that my enjoyment of the folk music of our isles, to which I like to listen when driving my car, introduced me to the Dubliners version of Brendan Behan's Captains and the Kings which you will probably know better. A delightful parody of other expressions of English exceptionalism 
as he saw them as a Republican Irishman in the mid 20th century. Around early 2016, both versions might have appeared as dated as some of the patriotic Irish ballads on which Bean was brought up in the Dublin of the 1930s. The rejection of EU membership in the referendum was, as I could see from my mailbag as an MP, often expressed in terms of its alleged incompatibility with principles of sovereignty, democracy, our system of law, and above all, our identity differences to other countries. Taking back control was the most common slogan of those writing, and one cannot and shouldn't dismiss this for lacking precision, as it clearly reflected some deeply held convictions. Even now that we are gone from the EU, the legacy lives on, and some UK politicians are happy uh, to embrace it. Us, it's also being argued that it's time to curb judicial interference in our national affairs, restore a traditional form of governance in which the executive should be less constrained in its actions. International obligations, such as the European Convention on Human Rights, and most recently, the Northern Ireland Protocol, are criticized as being in some way incompatible with our national tradition of sovereign independence. So now may be a good time to look at this subject that recent political events has brought back into the foreground. Consider where it comes from, what it's doing, and where it might be taking my country. The first thing I would say is that English exceptionalism is much older than the British Empire. We can go back to Shakespeare for striking expressions of it. It's present in the Sceptred Isles speech of John of Gaunt. The speech comes in Richard II, the first of the great historical plays. It's just worth reading out in its entirety. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise. This fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. This happy breed of men, this little world. This precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. But the character, John of Gaunt, then goes on in a rather different vein, lamenting the loss of sovereignty through the actions of Richard II's favorites and foreign alliances. This nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre in stubborn jury of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. I die pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in with a triumphant sea whose rocky shores beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others has made a shameful conquest of itself. Or would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death. The play was written in about 1595, and as you may deduce, is intensely political in content. John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, the father of Henry Bolingbroke, uh, who was soon to usurp the throne from Richard and have him murdered, was the founding father of the House of Lancaster, from whom the Tudors claimed legitimacy, and was articulating the eventual justification for Richard II's overthrow, namely that he had leased out the realm to its ruin was written as Elizabeth I was aging and the future looked uncertain and enemies numerous. It certainly tells us something of how cultured Englishmen like to see their identity at the end of the 16th century, rather less perhaps about the late 14th century. Gaunt himself was definitely part of the international set of his time. He might indeed now be denounced as a citizen of nowhere, born abroad at Ghent in Flanders, hence his name, he spent two years of his life in Spain trying to become King of Castile and quite a few others in Gascony speaking French. As I've on occasion gently pointed out to Jacob Rees-Mogg when he started extolling the deeds of Gaunt's grandson, Henry V and his longbowman at Agincourt, 
when pressing the cause for leaving the EU, if Henry V had succeeded in his ambitions, England would have become the appendage of a larger, more populous and much wealthier France, with the king enthroned in Paris. Vassinage indeed, as Boris Johnson might say. But we can't lightly dismiss Shakespeare's praise of some quintessentially English identity that was believed to set us apart from others as just literary hyperbole. By the end of the 16th century, notions of English exceptionalism were already very clear, ran back some way and had a long way to go as well. Part of it lies in the early development of administrative centralization in an England which by the 13th century, unique for the state of its size in Europe and without the power of regional territorial magnates to challenge the crown by competing jurisdictions something of which in contrast, you had plenty here in Ireland. The heart of the United Kingdom's present constitution, we refer today to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. The queen in parliament acting with the consent of her lords and commons exercises power unlimited by any other lawful authority. At least in theory, this means that any government uh, with a parliamentary majority could pass a bill requiring us to collectively worship the moon every other Tuesday, provided the Queen were minded to give royal assent to it, no such assent having been withheld since the reign of Queen Anne, then that's the law of the land and we can be punished for not complying. When this doctrine first fully emerged in 1534, Henry VIII's act of supremacy showed the ability of the King with parliamentary authority and consent to coerce his subjects on matters of deepest conscience and belief, and was used with entirely revolutionary effect to overturn the existing order of Catholic Christianity under papal authority in England. An order that most contemporaries consider at the time permanent and immutable. Both our islands are littered with the ruins and consequences that testify to the ruthlessness of royal policy at the time, and with lasting effect on both our national psyches. When the struggle between Crown and Parliament was resolved in the latter's favour in the 17th century, the Bill of Rights of 1689 was enacted and created the powers and privileges that the United Kingdom Parliament has today. It was, of course, with those self-same powers that Parliament in 1972, at the behest of the then Conservative government, enacted the European Communities Act, which gave primacy to EU law in this country. And again, in 2019, enacted the legislation to abolish it. And when in the same year, a majority of the House of Commons, concerned by both the threat of its prorogation to facilitate a no deal Brexit, seized control of the business of the House to thwart the executive in its aims, my last success in politics, we were using exactly the same powers to do it. But to this doctrine of sovereignty is closely linked the principle that it will only be exercised within certain limits. Commemorating Magna Carta in England in 2015, we were remembering, I think, not so much a historical event, most people have only the vaguest notion of what it was about, but the creation of a national narrative of exceptionalism. The barons who were responsible for obtaining King John's assent, had preoccupations far removed from our own. They were dealing with a king who was operating outside the norm of kingship in the early 13th century, not the 21st. He was directly threatening their personal interests and potentially their lives if they couldn't curb his tyrannical tendencies. But if as a peace treaty, it was a total failure, civil war resuming within weeks, the reissue of the Charter after John's death caused it to become embedded in the consciousness of medieval England. The Charter was of practical importance because it reduced the ability of the Crown to raise money by arbitrary fines or levies, which led directly to the need for a monarch to summon councils, or as they were called by the 1320s Parliament, to approve general taxation. Once the Commons emerged as a distinct body by the end of the 13th century, this practice was institutionalised as was the power of the commons to demand redress of grievances in return for the taxes granted. But I think as importantly, the Charter expresses an insistence on abstract concepts of justice 
that was seen by the barons as being overarching and inherent to the realm and land of England of which they were a part, in which 150 years after the Norman conquest, they saw as a polity, not just a place where they happened to have their estates. It's particularly noticeable in the two surviving clauses in England, the only one still in force with us are 39 and 40, which respectively concern the prohibition or punishment without due process of law and the promise not to delay or deprive a person of justice still cited today as the defining statements of the rule of law and the limits of arbitrary state power. In the, uh, the charter also speaks more generally of the law of the land, the law of the kingdom, the law of England. This law was not written down in any collection or treatise, but it was supposed, at least in theory, to offer men full justice according to their status. It drew on ideas of good and bad kingship that derived from the Bible and the coronation oath introduced in England as far back as the ninth century. In the hundred years after the charter was sealed, it was being invoked repeatedly. 1297, it's issued as a statute. 1300, we have appropriately Essex peasants using it as a justification to complain of their Lord's bailiff's behavior in a manorial court. Kings were required to reissue it on accession. It was extended six times in the 14th century at the request of the commons to apply to all irrespective of social status. By the mid 15th century, we have Chief Justice Fortescue writing in his treatise De Laudibus Legum Angliae in praise of the laws of England. His work is an absolute study in English exceptionalism. He stated that the King of England can't alter or change the laws of his realm at his pleasure, something highly relevant to who had the power to trigger Article 50 to leave the EU. And he contrasted this with the practice elsewhere in Christendom. He also deprecated the use of torture, lauded the system of trials by jury and its uniqueness to England, stating that, and I quote, you would rather 20 evil doers to escape death through pity and one man be unjustly condemned. In the oath of office, I took on appointment as attorney general, which dates from the high years of Tudor despotism. I noted with interest that I was required to say, I will duly and truly minister the queen's matters and sue the queen's process after the course of the law and after my cunning. I think that's cunning in the 16th century rather than the Blackadder sense. I will duly and in convenient time speed such matters as any person shall do in law against the queen, as I may lawfully do, without long delay, tracting or tarrying the party of his lawful process in that that to me belongeth. Thus, in serving as the queen's lawyer, I was also made to promise as required by clause 40 of the charter, not to abuse my position to delay justice for anyone else. It's too easy in England to get carried away with these idealizations of our unique and ancient liberties and rights. Lord Sumption has highlighted that charters of rights were not uncommon phenomena in medieval Europe. They were in any event routinely bypassed and abused in practice. English kings authorized torture in breach of the common law by special warrant under the Privy Seal, rather as President Bush did for the CIA after 9-11. Juries were rigged and coerced and justice bought and denied. And under Henry VIII, Parliament was briefly overawed into allowing the creation of criminal offences for breaches of proclamations, albeit not without protest. And of course, here in Ireland, where the Magna Carta Hibernia was granted by Henry III on his accession in 1217, Poynings law rather undermined the development of any form of a local parliamentary check on executive action. Yet I did note with interest recently that your false imprisonment act 1410 of Henry IV is still on your statute book, a late medieval echo of those principles. But in the century that followed the writing of Richard II by Shakespeare, these themes did become prominent in the dispute between King and Parliament. 60 years before the Bill of Rights, when Sir Edward Cook, the Chief Justice of James I defied the King, and argued his sovereignty was limited by rules of natural law and not just the need to govern through Parliament, it returns to focus. James, coming from Scotland, lacked any concept of legality external to the fact of his being king, 
When at Newark on the way to his coronation, he ordered the summary execution of a cut purse without any hearing or due process, it caused consternation to his English entourage as it was a flagrant breach of a statute of 1354. When the king, as an exercise of a prerogative right, demanded that proceedings challenging the crown's right to grant a benefice be stayed, Cook refused, saying, the stay required by your majesty was a delay of justice and therefore contrary to law and the judge's oath. Cook developed the idea of an ancient constitution coming from the Anglo-Saxons, reinforced by Magna Carta and now subverted. This was, of course, complete myth. There is no evidence of this from the Anglo-Saxons, as Mark Morris has recently confirmed in his excellent book on them, any more than there is of their having seen themselves as blessed with any kind of exceptionalism at all. But it was all potent stuff. Later, he went further and commented that in many cases, the common law will control acts of parliament, sometimes to judge them void. For when an act of parliament is against common right and reason or repugnant, or impossible to be performed, the common law will control it and to judge it to be void. In the 18th century, Blackstone in his commentaries dismissed this last statement as erroneous, as it suggested judicial and not parliamentary supremacy. But as I discovered as attorney general in the case of the correspondence of the Prince of Wales, Evans against the attorney general, its ghost still haunts the relations of our legislature, executive, and our courts. Thus the Bill of Rights of 1689 contains within itself a contradiction. Its 13 clauses create the powers and privileges Parliament now enjoys today and asserts the primacy of Parliament over the will of monarchs and now her ministers. In particular, Clause 9 in its traditional interpretation created the principle that the actions of Parliament could not be challenged in any court and that the will of Parliament as expressed in its statutes could be interpreted in our courts, but could not be contradicted or overturned. If the justification for the Bill of Rights was that James II had sought to subvert and extirpate the laws and liberties of the kingdom, then what if it was the government of the crown with a parliamentary majority who sought to do just that? On this, of course, the Bill of Rights is silent. The draftsmen saw the Lords and Commons in Parliament as the defenders of a tradition that included Magna Carta and habeas corpus, and not as the potential underminers of those principles. But in the centuries since, this issue has remained a pretty lively topic. Lay at the root of the argument of the American colonies in their Declaration of Independence, complaining of Parliament's oppressive taxes led afterwards to the US Congress enacting a constitution that gave primacy to its judges to limit what Congress could do. And the idea of overarching political rights has been invoked at the time of the Great Reform Act of 1832 by the Chartists in the 1840s, the suffragettes who compared themselves to the barons of 1215 in demanding votes for women uh, uh, and resorting to violence when legislation was blocked by a parliamentary majority and by those who standing on the steps of the Dublin Mansion House proclaimed the Doyle Aaron in 1919, and those who maintained, and there were quite a few. That the 2016 referendum was a return of sovereignty from parliament to the people whose will expressed in the outcome turned both the executive and MPs into mere agents of implementation and traitors if they tried to moderate its full intent as interpreted by them. And while our tradition of parliamentary sovereignty has through practice over time been hedged with conventions about the way the state should behave, those conventions can undoubtedly be ignored and are usually where a government's facing threats to public order or national security, or even simply on the grounds of administrative convenience or political advantage where there's a sufficient majority. We saw convention working to stop labor when it wanted to enact 90-day and 42-day pre-charged detention, as the hostility of the commons destroyed it. But convention has often failed to prevent the abuse of power by public authorities towards vulnerable or relatively powerless groups, be it the elderly or children in care or the ill treatment of detainees, such as happened in Kenya during the Mau Mau rebellions or in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. 
Most tellingly, governments with majorities can also ignore conventions and deeply respected principles when enacting legislation. This was shown in the Bancourt case in the House of Lords in 2009. Clause 40 of Magna Carta may prohibit exile, but it didn't prevent a government making a law to authorize exactly this in the British Overseas Territory so as to permanently exile the Diego Garcians from their island homes. But harking after the simplicities of untrammeled parliamentary sovereignty, which now seems rather popular in England, as long as it's being used the way people want it to be, also misses the part international legal obligations play in observ the observance of the rule of law and in our constitution. In the course of more recent British history, but particularly since the end of the Second World War, the United Kingdom has increasingly embarked on policies that have developed and changed our laws through international engagement. Notwithstanding pride in sovereignty, successive British governments have sought to make the world a better, safer, more predictable place by participating in and encouraging the creation of international agreements governing the behavior of states. When I was Attorney General, I once inquired of our foreign office as to how many treaties we were adherent. They were unwilling to go back before 1834, which excluded our earliest treaty of friendship with Portugal of 1386, negotiated for the benefit of John of Gaunt. Since 1834, however, they had records then of 13,200 treaties and agreements the UK had signed and ratified, and that figure is now closer to 14,000, making the United Kingdom probably the greatest treaty maker in world history. Many thousands are still applicable, a range in importance from the UN Charter, promoted by Eleanor Roosevelt as a Magna Carta for the 20th century, to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, to local treaties over fishing rights. Over 700 contain references to the possibility of binding dispute resolution in the event of disagreements over interpretation. And increasingly, be they the European Convention on Human Rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, or the creation of the International Criminal Court, they deal not just with interstate relations, but with standards of behavior between a state and those over whom it exercises power. That's become so important that the ministerial code until 2015 made express and specific reference to the duty of UK ministers to respect our international treaty obligations. The wording was then deliberately changed by David Cameron in a fit of pique at being too often reminded of this point, probably by me. But the amendment doesn't remove the obligation as the cabinet office conceded. It's part of Lord Bingham's eighth principle of the rule of law. If it were abandoned, we would be sanctioning anarchy on the international stage. And UK governments, for all their faults, have, despite some lapses, been pretty consistent up to now in observing its principles. We went to war in 1914 over the violation of Belgian neutrality, which we guaranteed when the then German Chancellor, whose country had also signed it, dismissed it as a scrap of paper. Not a week goes by without the Foreign Secretary informing the UK Parliament of our determination to stand up for the international rules-based system against those who seek to undermine it. Such declarations won't be taken seriously if your own government isn't observing the rules itself. But as you will have noted, some at present are questioning the value of such obligations, arguing we should reduce or abandon some of them. The process of leaving the EU has undoubtedly provided an impetus. As one of the key justifications for going was to throw off the principle of the direct effect of EU law. The direct effect was, of course, a unique requirement imposed on all member states of the EU to ensure that the harmonization of rules to create a level playing field for the running of the EU and its single market, created at least in part by the endeavors of Mrs. Thatcher, was implemented and maintained. Whether leaving will in practice deliver the total freedom sought is highly questionable. Our trade and cooperation agreement with the EU continues to be heavily influenced by the interpretation of EU law by the European Court of Justice. And in some cases, the EU is seeking to maintain European Court of Justice jurisdiction, as there clearly now is over the terms of the withdrawal agreement itself, 
including the working of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which created the requirement that the UK introduce border checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland to maintain Northern Ireland's continuing position in the EU's economic zone. My colleague Geoffrey Cox lost office as Attorney General for pointing out that the Prime Minister could not fail to put in those border checks without putting those border checks in without breaching an international treaty to which he just signed up. The offensive and offending clauses in the Internal Markets Bill duly followed last autumn. It is, however, I think noteworthy that when the government sought to enact them into law, it faced significant opposition in both Commons and Lords and had to abandon its intention to threaten to breach intentionally its international obligations. But as we're seeing, the issue's not gone away. It undoubtedly threatens the United Kingdom's international standing. All this highlights for me that there would appear to be a significant number in my country who have a discomfort over the impact of international law on sovereignty, where it places any restraint on the United Kingdom's right to legislate at will on domestic matters. I don't have time today to go into the history of our adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights and its voluntary incorporation into our own law through the Human Rights Act. But it is an example of an international treaty that has nothing to do with the EU, which nevertheless results in disagreements as to its value. A recent examination suggests to me that the overall impact of the ECHR has been entirely beneficial. Created in the early 1950s in large part by UK lawyers, over the years, it's been operated as a living instrument which has allowed it to develop organically and in accordance with social change, just as has our common law. Its application in this lively and relevant manner has produced landmark decisions which have challenged or halted practices which were once considered acceptable, but which would now be recognized as unacceptable by the overwhelming majority of the British public, and that indeed of the, of the citizens of Western democracies generally. Just to take a few examples, state discrimination against children on the grounds of illegitimacy, criminalization of homosexual acts in private, blanket retention of DNA obtained by the police from people who've since been neither charged nor convicted, flogging as a criminal punishment, excluding same-sex couples from new civil partnership laws, presence of military officers sitting in civilian courts as judges, and placing a positive obligation on adherent states to stop people trafficking as it was classified as a form of slavery. Despite difficulties over the enforcement of some of its judgments, the Strasbourg Court can show that it's been instrumental in bringing about positive change by governments and public authorities, often in countries with little history of democracy and long track records of human rights violations. It's even helped transform human rights standards in non-member states a willingness to follow the Strasbourg court judgment scrupulously in the case of the deportation of Abu Qatada to Jordan, despite the fury of a section of the British tabloid press, in fact helped ensure permanent statutory reforms to the Jordanian criminal justice system, which were both needed and welcomed, as well as eventually getting him deported from the United Kingdom. Our support for the convention has thus been a national stage. There will, of course, always be downsides to any form of international legal cooperation and treaty making. On occasion, the European Court of Human Rights has produced decisions that are questionable, as was that against the blanket ban on convicted prisoners voting in elections. That long ruling impasse was however resolved in the United Kingdom with hardly anybody noticing. A bigger criticism from English exceptionalists is it allows for the development of our law by decisions of a non-national court, not by debate and laws passed by parliament, and therefore seen as somehow offensive to our unwritten constitution. The point's not invalid. It led to Lord Sumption's critique of the convention and the Human Rights Act in his recent Reith lectures. He considered that the rights which the Strasbourg court has added by interpretation have transformed it, and I quote, from an expression of noble values into something meaner. It's become a template against which to assess most aspects of the domestic legal order, including some highly disputable ones, 
and the result has been to devalue the whole notion of universal human rights. It goes on, many people will feel that some at least of the additional rights invented by Strasbourg ought to exist, I think so myself, but the real question is whether the decision ought to be made by judges. It is, however, noteworthy that Lord Sumption didn't advocate some particular solution to this issue beyond a call on both Strasbourg and our national domestic judges to exercise greater care in determining how far it's right to differ with democratic institutions. He also acknowledged that there's evidence of greater restraint by judges now than existed a few years ago. It's of course always possible to leave the European Convention on Human Rights if the United Kingdom wished to do so. It's our undoubted sovereign right to do it. But if we were to leave, it would jeopardize our role in the Council of Europe, the key forum that remains to us to exercise influence in our European neighborhood for our own and others' benefit. And where our leading role has long been recognized. It would also make it impossible for us to negotiate security and data sharing agreements with the EU, which are of great importance to our national security. The basis for any future cooperation will be underpinned by a shared adherence to the convention, if it's to occur at all. It would send a clear signal internationally that we're downgrading our interest in promoting human rights. On withdrawing, we would then be left with the question of whether there should be any rights that enjoy special protection in our country. If there are, I happen to think the public shows no sign of wanting to return to pre-ECHR times, then we're going to spend an enormous amount of effort recreating many of the same issues in the application of such rights all over again. Ultimately, the UK Parliament chooses to allow the judiciary to review decisions made by government departments and ministers about individuals and gives those individuals the right to be treated in accordance with principles of fairness and respect, what are seen by most of us as fundamental principles for living in a free democracy, then those determinations must always involve striking and balance between competing public interests, which is an inherently political exercise. The idea, however, that Parliament can of itself provide that scrutiny is fanciful. It has neither the means nor the time and resources, and I suspect actually the inclination to do so, in a world where the intrusive power of the state over the lives of individuals has grown exponentially through legislation in the last century. Lurking behind the current political debate is a wider concern that there may be domestic judicial activism, which is effectively ignoring and undermining parliamentary sovereignty. Well, the government is justified in taking some or as yet unspecified action to curb it. The Conservative Party manifesto of the 2019 general election speaks opaquely of, I quote, ensuring that judicial review is available to protect the rights of individuals against an overbearing state while ensuring that it's not abused to conduct politics by another means. However, I see little or no evidence of such abuse justifying the manifesto statement, nor could Lord Folkes, who was tasked by the government to carry out a review of judicial review, which reported earlier this year. But it hasn't prevented the UK government embarking on yet another consultation on the matter. This stems from an obsession with the role of the judiciary over Brexit related decisions, which shows a striking lack of understanding of legal process and historic UK constitutional principles. In both the key Brexit cases brought by Ms Miller and others, the first on the triggering of Article 50 without parliamentary involvement, and the second on the peremptory prorogation of parliament for a period of six weeks mid term, the Supreme Court acted at the instance of a citizen by due process to review decisions taken by the government purportedly under prerogative powers. It's the well-established right, even the duty of our courts to do so, just as was held by Sir Edward Cook in the case of proclamations as far back as 1611. The government argued in Miller that it was entitled to trigger Article 50 under the Royal Prerogative because its action was confined to our international treaty obligations and the vast domestic changes to UK law enjoyed under UK statutes that would and have followed were an incidental consequence of this, being action that Parliament had not expressly or impliedly restricted by any statute. The Supreme Court disagreed 
and Parliament duly sanctioned the triggering of Article 50 by statute. Far from inhibiting Brexit, it enabled it to take place more smoothly by giving it a pro the process a structure where previously it had been the every appearance of chaos. The same, I think, can't be said of the case on prorogation. Suspending Parliament from sitting by executive diktat, save for the purpose of a few days necessary to start a new session, or as a preliminary to a general election, was unprecedented in modern times and made the more questionable by the government's dishonesty in denying it was planning it. The action was declared null and void because the government could provide no reasonable explanation to justify the prevention of parliament from carrying out its proper constitutional functions. This too is a classical application of the fundamental principles on which there is judicial review of government action. In making its unanimous decision, the justices of the Supreme Court dismissed the argument that there could be some prerogative acts which were of such high policy that the courts could never review them as they were untouchable. This is a very different argument from the one often accepted by the courts that they should refrain from pronouncing on the exercise of a power to which the law can provide no answer. That may be irritating for government, but it follows on a pattern of legal development that, as we have seen, goes back a very long way. It's not to say the judges must always be right, even if one or two of them like to think so. But the working of a modern pluralist democracy is not compatible with sidelining courts. Generally, the courts of the United Kingdom have shown great deference to Parliament and the judges are bound by their oaths to the Queen to act judicially. But the louder government and Parliament get, in supporting measures that might break the conventions that underpin the constitutional relationship between judiciary and government, the greater the risk in fact grows of that deference being reduced. Still, such a collision is rather a doomsday scenario and fortunately at present remains hypothetical. But its grounds were identified by Lord Stain, a former member of the then appellate committee of the House of Lords in a case called Jackson and the Attorney General when he said, the supremacy of parliament is still the general principle of our constitution. It is a construct of the common law. The judges created this principle. If that is so, it's not unthinkable that circumstances could arise where the courts may have to qualify a principle established on a different hypothesis of constitutionalism. In exceptional circumstances involving an attempt to abolish judicial review or the ordinary role of the courts, the appellate committee of the House of Lords or the new Supreme Court may have to consider whether this is a constitutional fundamental which even a sovereign parliament acting at the behest of a complacent House of Commons cannot abolish. Those elected on the basis of the 2019 Conservative Manifesto should perhaps take note. Finally, in this overview of sovereignty and exceptionalism in the UK English context, and where the tensions lie, we can't ignore the consequences of devolution. The Act of Union with Scotland of 1707 presupposed that apart from the Presbyterian settlement and the maintenance of a separate legal system, all decisions thereafter would be made in common at Westminster, and even those preserved areas were open to change thereafter by Westminster legislation. But the Union has not suppressed identity, and it's in response to issues of identity in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland that devolution of power has been carried out by parliamentary acts. Although Enoch Powell once famously argued that power devolved is power retained as the Westminster Parliament can legally take back what it's given away, 20 years after the first devolution settlements took place, the view expressed then by Tony Blair that the Scottish Parliament was no more than a large local authority doesn't really seem to square with reality. The Prime Minister has rejected granting another referendum on independence. But if the SNP government now elected on a manifesto to demand one and a majority in the Scottish Parliament back it by resolution, then it is actually rather hard to see how it can be resisted without a prolonged constitutional crisis, even if sovereignty on this issue does lie in, uh, under, under uh, the Devolution Act at Westminster. 
Northern Ireland has, of course, the option secured by international treaty to leave the United Kingdom by majority expressed in the referendum, both there and in your country. Question as to whether Brexit is helping create conditions in which such a referendum has to take place remains very much open, although it is hard to see how it's going to be of any assistance in current circumstances. It's not my intention in this talk, nor is the time to discuss how the current challenges posed by devolution can best be resolved. But the issue can't be ignored in the discussion on sovereignty, identity, and exceptionalism. But concepts of sovereignty now being promoted have distinctive resonances in the different constituent parts of the United Kingdom. As a historical narrative, it's difficult to escape that they have an overwhelmingly English flavor to them. That's not to say that the concept of parliamentary sovereignty, or for that matter, rights conferred by Magna Carta are irrelevant north of the border. Far from it, the Scottish border. Far from it, and a union enables them to be invoked there as much as here. But Westminster parliamentary sovereignty ignores Scotland's own constitutional concept that sovereignty lies with the people. Cross-fertilization of civil and common law that has made the union a success may have left the potential for tension as yet unspoken and unresolved when it comes to identity. Northern Ireland, the issue of identity and how to reconcile differing uh, varieties and still enable its people to live in harmony lies at the heart of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Present position and trend in discourse seems to me to ignore this delicate situation completely. Recent opinion polling suggests that a significant number in England may be willing to sacrifice the union with Scotland so as to pursue their own ideas of sovereign identity. That certainly concerns me. I would personally consider such an outcome to be catastrophic for my country's future well-being. As the creation of the union at its best was a key event in forming the political community in which I live and which has helped deliver the prosperity and peace which most Britons prize. Indeed, it's always seemed to me to lie at the root of what has made the United Kingdom a successful nation with its identity rooted in the political and not a cultural community and able to integrate and value all who might wish to throw in their lot with it something we've developed particularly well since the trauma of losing Irish participation in that project a century ago, and explains in part our relative success in handling immigration. It's incumbent on those in government who believe in promoting an altered sovereign identity to explain how they intend to carry all parts of the United Kingdom with them in what looks currently like a narrowly based project. Some have expressed surprise that English exceptionalism should have arisen in its current form. I have to say I'm not, because it was noticeable throughout my political career that there was a growing gulf between the rhetoric and reality of the United Kingdom's identity and interests and with it of England's place within it. Nation states as all communities held together, both by self-interest, but also by shared history and imagination need narratives to sustain them, as you know so well in Ireland. But as you'll also know, the romanticization of those narratives and associated myth creation readily gives rise to both benign and malign fantasies of identity. It's the duty of political classes to be aware of this and to moderate them, provide leadership to harness national identity to attain realistic and positive goals. The success and endurance of the United Kingdom owes much to this working pretty well up to now. Something of a magician's trick in marrying a distinct national political identity uh, based on a strong sense of historical continuity with high levels of international engagement, cooperation, and indeed sovereignty pooling. But I've watched this break down as politicians have abandoned this in favor of jumping on bandwagons of identity politics that provide comforting displacement activity away from the great challenges of globalization, 
climate change, mass migration, and an increasingly chaotic and rather frightening multipolar world. But I would not despair. Mixture of good fortune and the wisdom of our forebears has given much of which there is to be proud and to celebrate, and which is positive for a shared future for my country, and also with you within these aisles, and indeed with our neighbours in mainland Europe. A continent in which the United Kingdom is distancing itself through Brexit, on the grounds of our exceptionalism, has plenty of examples of the tyranny of historical narratives and in some places they look alive and well. Indeed, ironically, they're sometimes put forward by leavers to justify our decision to leave the EU. And as we don't have a history of being oppressed, I would be surprised if we were to wish to replicate them in the UK or in England. A successful nation state in an interconnected world will be able to emphasize and ensure how its own varied constitutional inheritance and traditions can contribute to a wider good. And I think that that is what we will continue doing once this current episode is over. In the meantime, we need our friends in Ireland and elsewhere to have some forbearance and above all, perhaps, a sense of humour. Thank you very much. <laughs>